uh, yeah, any questions, feedback, uh, thoughts? Yeah. How did they move like sofas and like fridges and stuff like that? Well, she didn't have a fridge, but the sofa we moved. Uh, I mean, some folks there, because they've really gotten into it, have really developed some pretty heavy duty trailers, you know? And uh, I mean, it's slow, but, you know, and I'm not much of a bike mechanic, which means none of a bike mechanic, but there was one, the guy who had the sofa, he, 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 he belted himself, and it's this big, long trailer with pretty thick tires on it, and it can take a lot of weight, yeah. And it just, and it, it was flat. <laughs> You know, Portland has, the, I, I don't want to get into that, it, Portland has this really unusual system of government. It's unlike almost any other city in the United States. There's a, a five-member city council, including the mayor, and the mayor directly assigns all of the bureaus out, divides it up among all of the city commissioners. So in addition to being like the policy-making body for the city, each commissioner and the mayor is in charge of bureaus. And they made this one commissioner, Earl Blumenauer, who is now a member of Congress and is chairman of the Congressional Bike Caucus. He, he's the guy you've probably seen. He wears a little bike pin all the time and a bow tie. And, um, and he, you know, it's kind of interesting. At first, he'd been very focused on getting more uh, light rail and streetcars in Portland, really developing that whole thing. And there was kind of this bike movement developing uh, in the wake of the first Gulf War. Remember the original Persian Gulf War back in what was that, 90, 91? Out of, out of that, it actually, there'd been kind of a, a movement, you know, an anti war movement. And some of the people who got involved in that decided, kind of also got involved in forming a bike group uh, called the Bicycle Transportation Alliance. And, um, you know, they sort of were connecting, reducing you know, the, the need for war by reducing the use of oil, and they were also ticked off that the city wasn't doing a lot for bikes. And uh, they kind of, they managed to get Blumenauer's ear after a couple years, and he, he uh, hired a very aggressive uh, bicycle coordinator for the city, a woman, young woman named Mia Burke, who was really filled with brimstone, and basically her marching orders were go like hell, and it's better to apologize than to ask for permission. And so there were a couple times when there was this one street where they had been marked out as being for a bike lane, and one, like a Friday afternoon or something, she got a, uh, a call from the street crew saying, hey, we're supposed to repave the street, and it says on some map they're supposed to put in a bike lane, and so she grabbed a city uh, engineer or traffic engineer and they hustled down there and they quickly designed a bike lane <laughs> and the city repaved over the weekend, striped in the bike lane and these business owners came in Monday morning and it's like, what the hell? And, um, you know, so she made all the rounds, made all these calls, gosh, I'm so sorry. And, and then for years <laughs> afterwards, she, you know, it won't happen again and she just loved to tell the story at bike conferences and stuff. And, um, and so she actually, she kind of ran out the end of her bureaucratic string and actually is now in this very successful bike uh, and pedestrian planning and project company in the private sector. But um, that really was kind of what got things going there. And, and, a, and in a way, it couldn't happen in a lot of cities because you didn't have a politician in direct control of the bureaucracy. But what I found, as I was saying earlier, is People, you know, when they start seeing the world from the perspective of a bike seat, they start changing and, and it's amazing. It can be people you really wouldn't think of. The mayor of Boston, I always butcher his name, I think it's Tom Menino, something like that. For years, he never liked bikes. He, the city didn't do anything. They had a bike coordinator for a while. He got canned. They didn't replace him. Uh, there wasn't, I don't think, a bike lane in the city. For years, Boston routinely made bicycling magazines in a list of 10 worst cities in the United States. And, but you think about it, Boston, would, that should be a great place for bicycling. It's pretty compact and uh, a lot of narrow street. You know, it, it was a cow, pa cow pass originally in the old part of Boston. There's a lot of potential there. A couple summers ago, the mayor, I guess somebody told him he needed to get more exercise or something, and he got on a bike, started riding around. In fact, one of those uh, coaster bikes, you know, where the automatic shifting thing, 
I tried once, I didn't really like it, but he liked it. And all of a sudden, bikes were good. And he, they hired a new bike coordinator. They're, they're doing some bike lanes. Uh, they're starting to take it seriously. And, you know, it was one guy who just started seeing the, the city in a different way. Now, I think, you know, that's not true everywhere, but uh, it, it is fascinating how that happens. You know, it's, it's really almost literally just one, one cyclist at a time. Sure. No, that's okay. Yeah. It seems like we've got everything except for support from the government. And uh, there seems to be this critical step missing that we can't seem to find the right politician in the right place to make us get us over that hump where we can start getting some government support. That's interesting. Sort of fallout did well, you know, the interesting thing was, well, yeah, he got really punished. He got elected to Congress. You know, the thing is, <laughs> most, most people would say, and I, I have to, I'm a political reporter, although I cover more state and national politics. I have to say I was, for the most part, pretty clueless to what they were doing. I, I mean, I noticed the bike lanes and stuff, but you know, that's the fascinating thing is maybe you get some businesses along the street complain, and you would if you wrote a story about bicycling, people would complain in letters that, you know, I'm getting so annoyed with these cyclists, they take up the roads everywhere, and they're rude, and they run red lights, and all that kind of stuff, some of which is true. And, um, but you know, it's amazing how when you change the streetscape, motorists oftentimes kind of shrug and then go on. I mean, it's just all kind of a blur. And what they found in Portland was there was so much unused road capacity that they could make all sorts of changes. There was this one main thoroughfare through the east side, or at least you would think it would, that was an arterial street that ran. It was two lanes in each direction, uh, northeast Gleason Boulevard, if anybody's familiar with Portland and but you know the traffic engineers really figured out there aren't that many people on that road and they did a road diet they shrunk down the the number of lanes to three and uh, put in bike lanes on each side and then they the third lane in the middle was a turning lane so if you wanted to turn you could do it from either direction go into that middle lane and really traffic does just as well because if somebody if you have a four-lane road and somebody wants to make a left turn, they're blocking that whole lane, so you only have one usable lane anyway. And it's just a simple thing, and they put it in. I didn't notice it for years because I, it just was kind of out of my orbit. That for, that was just not a road I happened to go on very much until I started doing research and people were talking about it. And I go, oh yeah, they did do that at some point. And most people just didn't even notice. So, so in a way, what my message is. Politicians can do a lot without really people noticing. They will notice that there's more cyclists, and some people will grumble about that, but I, I haven't seen a huge amount of downside, particularly since they're not really taking a lot of money away from other stuff. That's the key thing. A lot of this stuff is so cheap, really. It's just more political will than anything else. Yeah. Is there, sorry. That's okay. Is there simultaneously, a, like you're talking about growing the culture, to support a grassroots movement or a higher level yeah, that was action, in, was that simultaneous? Was that through the BTA or was that... No, it was, it kind of came group? about, you know, as indigenous of itself. Part of it was that as bicycling became easier and, you know, the city became more bike friendly, more people started doing it. They started kind of identifying with each other. The city's been a magnet for young people for a long time. You know, we have all these 20-something college-educated graduates who move there without jobs, you know, and they, <laughs> one reason why we have a high unemployment rate, one of the highest in the nation, and they will move up there to do indie bands, indie software, uh, indie food, you know, arn and arn and arn, and, um, and they found, and then the cool thing about Portland is people found that you can go up there, live in a house with a bunch of friends, and you don't need a car, you know, and that makes things a lot cheaper so you can spend 20 hours a week, you know, as a barista to, to pay the rent and then spend the rest of your time writing the great American software or whatever people do now. And uh, so, and young, so 